Okay. Um, so, firstly, any questions about tomorrow's presentation? These are like I sent a piazza note, but basically three slides covering the three questions. Yeah. So um, only one person in the group. Yeah, I mean, it would be uh, only one person can present unless you think really you need to. Okay, okay. just to save time because yeah. we have like fifty minutes and there uh, there will be inevitable slippage uh, in the process. Just that. Okay, and. Uh, Huh? Yeah, I'll send a Dropbox link out. Okay. So uh, yeah, so just, uh, give me a few hours <laughs> to do it. Okay, um, um, yeah, and uh, try to. You know, I mean, just as a sort of suggestion in terms of when you present, uh, you shouldn't simply just read the slide. Okay, so just think of your slide as a prop and you talk to the audience. So uh, look at it as an opportunity to just practice your public speaking skills, okay? Many conferences now when you have papers, sorry, when you have poster presentation, they have this thing called speed dating session, which is basically a one or two minute pitch on your poster, and the idea is you are attracting them, attracting the audience to come and visit your poster, okay? So this is kind of like the classic elevator pitch to a VC, okay? So think of it along those lines, right? I mean, you're trying to sell to me, I guess in this case for your grade, but just generally, uh, sort of, you know, your peers are your audience as well, so try to convey. And I think the other thing is that, uh, look, thus far only I have a global perspective of what the projects are. This way you will also, you'll see perhaps people are using uh, similar hardware or working on similar things, so hopefully uh, you can collaborate at some level there. Okay, so, um, uh, so uh, I want to pick up uh, the synchronization thread, and today the intent is to walk through some mechanisms. So, uh, towards the end, last time I talked about that how there are kind of these three types of synchronization goals that exist. Um, the loosest one is I simply want to synchronize the frequency, okay? So uh, this is usually the case in communication systems because you want the uh, frequency at the receiver to match the frequency of the transmitter so that you can decode bits uh, correctly. Uh, uh, next up is synchronizing phase. Uh, so uh, sort of just imagine that your local oscillator and the remote oscillator, if you think of them as square waves, if I superimpose, they're exactly, they're exactly aligned, okay? So not just the frequency is the same, but the phase is the same. And that's usually useful if you want to do something periodic and together, okay? And then finally, there is time synchronization, uh, where kind of your goal is that your clock should be identical. So we have agreed upon some coordinate system, uh, which is going from whatever, zero to infinity, and if I say I'm gonna do something at time t, and another node says I want to do something at time t, when it happens, it's actually happening at the same time. Now, uh, since I was going with the communication example, so actually it turns out that uh, um, uh, synchronizing uh, in terms of time is useful for communication also, because you can then prearrange to wake up at a designated time and then communicate, so you save energy. So when we were discussing Mac protocols, we had talked about that. Another example uh, which comes up is uh, something called coherent combining in communications. Anyone knows what that is? Have you heard this term, coherent combining? Yeah, okay, yeah, your group does that, okay. Uh, you do it, right? Okay, so coherent combining refers to the following notion, that let's say there's a puny little sensor node, and which is trying to send data out, okay? So normally we think in terms of sending data out to uh, one node, uh, one, uh, one, one receiver. But what if there are multiple receivers? And now they're all getting copies of the signal, and uh, if you think of, like de this is really a detection problem, right? Just like a sensor, I'm sensing what the, sen the transmitter is doing, so if I have multiple looks at it, then uh, I should be able to do it better. So imagine if I want to continually fuse the information that the different receivers are receiving. For it to happen successfully, they need to be time aligned. So imagine if I send a bit, and it's kind of a noisy bit, and all of you receive it, uh, so some sort of a waveform, but for you to combine that sig uh, sig uh, signal, you have to be in agreement on time so that you can then superimpose and kind of, let's say, average them or add them or whatever, right? Uh, so coherent combining refers to that concept, and you can think of it the reverse way also. Let's say 
um, you're trying to send something to a faraway device, then instead of using a single transmitter, you can use multiple transmitters, because maybe there are multiple base stations, and they're all sending identical message. And if we can arrange that these identical messages reach the receiver at identical times, then the receiver will see an addition of multiple identical signals and therefore a stronger signal. Uh, in the former case, uh, the, these different receivers have to agree upon a con common notion of time so that we can then add the signals. And in the latter case, they have to agree not just a common notion of time so that they can do something together, but they also have to compensate for different delays that may happen because the transmitter, may, different transmitters are not necessarily the same distance from the receiver. So coherent combining just refers to this notion. You can imagine doing coherent combining even at a single node with multiple antennas, but that's a lot simpler. The current thing in uh, wireless research is doing coherent combining among network nodes, which are kind of far, far apart. And uh, so this way you can have uh, long distance communication or equivalently for the same energy, sorry, for the same communication accuracy, you can spend less energy. So for example, people are, people use this thing if you if you have wireless devices in the city and they need to send things out to the antenna at the top of this building or something, uh, right? So if you can, if, if they could cooperate and, uh, and their time sync, then they can pull these things off. So that's, um, so com communication is an example application which sort of uh, works with all of these. The group, uh, Professor Chabrick's group, uh, what they are trying to do in some of the current research is multiple drones and they kind of talk to sensor nodes on the ground by coherently combining. So that will now, that's a much more challenging problem because drones are moving uh, and they need to be coherently sort of uh, combined. So, uh, but if one can pull off, terrific. People also use uh, uh, like in the reverse direction. So if you imagine like, Lots of and uh, lots of receivers in the city, and something happens. Some subset of them, uh, some 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 device uh, transmits a signal. A bunch, some subset will hear to them, and then using cloud computing resources, you can combine them. You can do some fancy algorithms, and then see uh, kind of detect what was what was transmitted. Okay, so let's see how we can pull these things off. So fundamental to synchronization is going to be some sort of information exchange. Okay, and in our case, the information exchange is you know, in terms of messages we exchange, but there are actually lots of examples of physical phenomenon where information exchange just happens uh, through the physical medium. There are these cute videos you will see on YouTube where they may have like a bunch of metronomes. Everyone knows what a metronome is, kind of a, okay. You put a bunch of metronomes, they are not synchronized, you put them on this table, and then after a while they become synchronized, okay. And what happens is that the vibrations couple through this table and then bring them into synchrony. Uh, we'll see, uh, nature also has examples of these, uh, like one of, one of the observations uh, from a long time ago has been that fireflies, uh, which I think exist in, of southeast part of this country, but they're very common in Asia and tropics. Uh, and the fireflies, these little insects, they blink in synchrony, okay? And so it's a pretty amazing sight that kind of, you know, dark night, suddenly all of them blink in synchrony. And again, there, they're observing each other's thing, and, essentially, and we'll talk about because how you can mimic benefit from that insight, okay? So, so there is an information exchange there also. In our case, life is simple. We can actually send messages. So. Uh, uh, so you can uh, send messages by either explicit timestamping, that is, I will send a packet and it will carry a timestamp as to when I sent the packet. Now even that little thing is actually a little bit tricky to pull off because while I'm sending the packet, to put a timestamp in it and then to also attach the error correcting code and all to it at the back of the packet requires a fairly agile piece of um, uh, hardware to do it, so oftentimes then you may send the timestamp in a subsequent packet just to keep your life simple. Uh, we'll also see that how uh, it's a bad idea to timestamp up in software. Uh, um, ideally, you need hardware support for it. You can also do implicit timestamping, which is basically you can agree, the, um, like I can say, I'll send, I'll send the time, I'll send the packet on my clock tick. So there is an implicit timestamp uh, there that you know that 
the timestamp at my end was um, at a particular clock tick. Um, uh, the strategies also uh, are in some cases one-way message exchange. I just send a message out, and in some cases a bi-directional message exchange. But as we'll talk about, uh, well, I'd shown you the equations last time, uh, also. But kind of the main thing is that every time I send a a sends a packet to B, and if A timestamps it and B timestamps it, I'm learning something about distance plus delay, uh, distance plus offset. Okay, and if you have sufficient number of these measurements from all over the network, then it's basically an optimization problem. You're trying to find the best fit solution, much like GPS was doing. GPS was trying to find what was um, uh, the location plus time offset, and you can think of it uh, analogously out here. Uh, there are a lot of sources of noise in this, confounders in this process. So there is the time is quantized. Whenever I'm time stamping, I'm time stamping relative to a clock of some frequency. And if it is coarse, then the time stamp is coarse. There is drift uh, that happens in clocks, even potentially even during while you are doing this message exchange. So last time I had in response to a question, I talked about that how underwater, if you are doing acoustic signaling, then the time duration of a packet can be pretty large, and clocks can drift during that period. Um, and so a variety of other perturbations, so therefore you need to kind of move away from a simple strategy. Uh, let's find out the uh, offset, and then treat, think of that as the offset. It's going to be a me noisy measurement, and it's going to be invalid pretty soon. So. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, and the final uh, thing out here is we also want to do this thing with um, some sort of resource optimization, right? And we really have uh, two types of resources that play out here. Uh, one is the usage of spectrum, and the other is the uh, energy I burn at the hardware level itself, okay? So in particular, uh, uh, a goal could be that you want to minimize number of messages exchange. So, uh, to develop this strategy, so, uh, so let's imagine, I mean, uh, I've said this thing multiple times, but uh, this equation, uh, so A sends a message to B, we are able to timestamp at both sides. Let's say these timestamps are um, done um, uh, accurately enough, then we end up with this, this one exchange gives us this constraint. It basically says that time at uh, T2A, sorry, T2B, which is the time at clock B, uh, sorry, time at B uh, uh, when the packet was received is equal to time uh, when the packet was sent according to clock A plus the delay from A to B, uh, which is really an independent parameter. It's just a passage of uh, uh, time plus the offset between the two clocks. And the challenge is we are trying to find offset A to B, but we also don't know the delay. So we obviously can't solve this uh, thing. But one thing we can do is if I make multiple such measurements, let's say every every millisecond I repeat the same exercise, then uh, and assuming delay A to B is constant, then I will basically begin to learn the drift in uh, the clock, so D over DT of the offset, uh, which is basically the drift that you have. So what you would generally see is that if I have a couple of nodes, um, uh, and uh, let's say they have somewhat different frequencies, but the frequency is stable, then what happens to their time kind of looks like this, right? I mean, there is a real time that, uh, sorry, there is a time according to some ideal clock, which will basically grow at the same rate as a real time. So you can think of that as a 45 degree line. And then any given node would correspond to a line, or more generally a meandering curve um, at some other uh, place, depending upon what's happening instantaneously. But let's imagine that the two nodes have stable frequencies, but different frequencies. So then in that case, the scenario is something like this. So now what's happening is I may do uh, some kind of uh, uh, measurement at a particular time and T1, and then later on I do another measurement at night two, two, T2, right? So what will happen is between T1 and T2, because of this drift, the offset has changed. Right, so uh, so it's not like I can, well, each time I'm doing that measurement, even if the delay is constant, the second term is changing, but the rate of growth between this is going to tell me the slope of the relative frequency difference between the two. So 
Okay, so uh, it, it gives that to me. So using this insight um, and kind of an assumption that perhaps over short time periods, I can uh, consider the uh, drift to be linear uh, or uh, um, uh, I could do something like this. So I can make multiple measurements and uh, these multiple measurements are, uh, sorry, the relative clock skew to be linear. I shouldn't say drift to be linear. Relative clock skew is linear. If we, if we make that assumption, um, then if I make multiple measurements in clock sequence, then uh, what will happen is that the first measurement was measuring a some offset, the second one is now offset has changed, but I'm assuming that over short time distance that offset is going linearly. So I'll have some sort of some, something like this. And the slope of this curve is going to give give me the relative drift that is happening. So uh, so so in a sense, this suggests a strat sort of a simple strategy, which is uh, you consider you, you keep sampling um, and you look at a time window. You make the assumption that it's short enough so that the clocks are um, that the linear model applies, and then you do uh, fitting of uh, it's your usual best fit line, and that is going to give you the drift. And once you have the drift, um, uh, then in a sense you are tracking, uh, you're, you're, you're creating piecewise linear approximation of what, what is happening between the two nodes, and you can use that to always predict what the current offset is going to be, even though you are making the measurements separated in time. Significantly. Uh, now, much of it will depend upon over what duration you can assume that these things are stable. So, some of the systems that use uh, this kind of strategy, uh, they'll probably sample at every 15, 30 seconds or something like that. Okay, so uh, because it's saying something about how stable clocks tend to be uh, in, 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 in real life. So, that's the uh, basics strategy that happens that we repeat that message exchange and thus far we only talked about one directional message exchange, right? So by repeating that one directional message exchange and fitting um, a line or more generally some low order polynomial. So it turns out that uh, with quartz crystal, the uh, drift because of temperature is cubic. Uh, so um, sort of order three polynomials are probably going to do the best in terms of capturing the physics behavior, but it turns out that this sort of linear model works fairly well in kind of real life. Um, so, so that's how it kind of works. Now, we still have the problem of that unknown delay, right? I mean, all this thing is going to do is it's going to give us delay plus offset, right? And the delay part is still unknown. So how can we get that? Well, one answer is, you pre-calibrate. So you know the hardware. Uh, you can uh, sort of, uh, uh, measure how much delay is going to be there. Now, there are two components of that delay. Uh, there is a component of delay which is at the receiver and the sender in the hardware. And then there is a time of flight delay. Okay. Uh, now, if nodes are moving or if you know nothing about uh, the separation between the two, then uh, again you will have a problem because there is no way you can calibrate this a priori, right? I mean, if I don't even know what the distance is going to be between the two nodes, then you'll have to do some guesstimate and uh, that's going to create an error in itself. So, but but let's assume that we are willing to tolerate that degree of error, okay? We may, we may know something about like, you know, it's a building scale network, okay? So maybe it's whatever, a couple of hundred meter. So uh, whatever delay we are going to face in that. So 200 meter is probably going to lead to speed of light. I think it's what, 600 nanosecond. So uh, that's the amount of delay that you are going, uh, going to see uh, in, in a system like that. But you have, if you, if you knew somehow the, if you can, if in a lab setting you can work out the delay, then uh, you can, plug that in back in the equation, and now you have a synchronization strategy, right? Because I know the delay number, so all I'm left with the offset, then I'm good to go. Uh, what happens under the hood, if you think about it, is that uh, I'm sending the packet, uh, or whatever, some piece of software or 
kind of some statements in the hardware that like, okay, let's send the packet out. Then at the sender, there is going to be a phase where you are trying to access the channel because these channels are shared channels. So usually there is some sort of a protocol, some arbitration protocol, which lets you grab the channel. And then the actual transmission happens. And that transmission, the corresponding reception is going to be located behind. That's the cause of propagation that is. So this is where the resistance factor comes in. And then at some stage, the receiver is going to give a complete packet to the layer above. And that is where uh, transmission is located. And if you kind of dive one level deeper into, uh, into it, so uh, there is a piece of software, there is this map protocol, then uh, after the map protocol grabs the channel, then there is actual uh, modulation circuitry and uh, RF circuitry, so there will be some delay there. There is a actual propagation which is happening, and likewise on the receive side, uh, there is a circuitry delay, and then eventually the packet is ready, and I have the uh, sort of software related delay to, to get it behaved in the right place. Um, but if we can pre-characterize all of these, then uh, I am uh, good to go. Now, that alone, uh, unfortunately, is not enough because, um, like, but also depends upon, uh, can I, uh, is that pre-characterization stable? So, the problem out here is that some of these delays are highly variable, okay? So, like, for example, the interaction between software and uh, radio is usually through interrupts. And they're highly variable. Map protocol is where you're trying to grab the channel. So it's kind of like a queue. Uh, if the wireless link is very busy, then this delay can be quite a bit. So this is highly variable. And likewise, the boundary between RF and software is also uh, interrupt driven, and therefore that too is variable. So where would you timestamp? Where should one timestamp? Right at this boundary, right at this boundary. That's the optimum place to timestamp, except that timestamp is kind of a digital function, so you probably won't be able to do it right there, but as close to it as possible. Uh, even the low-level hardware, which is doing the encoding and decoding, they have variable delays also, just because depending upon what is happening at the, uh, I mean, some of these algorithms, uh, the receiver in particular is basically kind of, uh, uh, algorithm which is to search for a good match. So these are these often are inherently variable delay algorithms. Okay, so but the closer you can do it, the better of you are. Uh, but in reality, what happens is it's pretty much impossible to do it at this level. So the closest you can come to is at this point, typical, typical hardware. Okay, so after the MAC protocol, uh, but at kind of the hardware level. So but the general thesis is as low as as close as you can get. Because if you are, uh, it's not very useful to say I will, I'm characterizing it from the perspective of the software because it will then depend upon how busy your channel is and stuff like that. Um, so, but we can, uh, we can uh, pre-calibrate, uh, but the problem is that uh, there is still variation. I mean, calibration uh, is, goes only so far uh, in this process. So this is uh, some data from a uh, former student of mine, uh, which sort of just collected it as part of his research. And just to kind of show the point out here, so what, what he did was, this was some pretty low level bare bones radios. You had control over kind of just sending a bit to the radio really, not even a packet. Um, and what you see out here is that uh, there is a spread. So what's happening is, uh, Transmitter is sending to receiver one, and all we are doing is, with respect to some reference, we are just measuring. Uh, so, transmitter is sent, sending at a known time, and we are measuring the delay when the receiver gets the transmission. And we see kind of the spread out there. And moreover, um, yeah, kind of uh, having uh, where the value got chopped off, what you see it out here. So, what's happening out here is that. This is a slow radio. We cannot see a 3.15 microsecond type delay. Um, but the spread around it is from 3.25 to 3.25, so it's roughly 0.2, right? Uh, what matters in this game is the uncertainty, right? I mean, I can, during my calibration phase in the lab, I can kind of do this stuff and let this envelope, 
uh, and then take the mean and say that's my best guess of the delay. But then the error in that delay is 0.2 microseconds. So it's basically saying that fundamentally this pre-calibration strategy is going to be limited uh, to a 0.2 microsecond variations in this particular case. I mean, obviously, it depends upon uh, thing. But 0.2 microsecond is pretty good. These were El Cheapo radios uh, um, operating uh, very. Uh, um, I mean, uh, this is a TI chip called PC2420. So these are the radios, which also called Zigbee radios, which are kind of built into meters and light bulbs and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, low cost devices. The other thing you would see is that, and which makes this process challenging is that uh, these delays vary device to device. So uh, while uh, 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 there is, uh, I mean the shapes look the same, but if you compare like RX1 to RX2 versus TX to RX2, you would see that the spread here is different than the spread there, okay? So, um, uh, so they are not every pair of devices identical, mm, lots of variations and all, which means again, uh, just pre-calibrating in the lab is again going to leave an error. So if you're looking at a, uh, if, you, if, you, if you take this strategy of pre-calibrate and deploy, then which two devices were you pre-calibrating? You are really again making, making a population level estimate and there would be additional error which will creep in because of that also, right? So, like, is the time delay between the zero and the very small because you are close to each other? Uh, I think in this particular case, he may have just subtracted it out. As in, he may have subtracted it from the mean, just zero shifting it. But I, I think it can be good because they are very close to each other. Uh, all of these experiments were done very close to each other. Uh, it was just in the lab, so it wasn't like they were separated out like this. And uh, the second question is that, uh, like, if you change the position of these devices, if you increase some other noise, then, like, are you? Yeah, so, so, absolutely right. So, what I'm pointing out is that this pre calibration strategy has limitations, right? It has limitations because if devices are not the same, and uh, I may not know the distance between them, and that distance may in any case be changing. And all of these things basically show up as an uncertainty factor, and that limits your synchronization, right? I mean, we are basically saying I'm assuming some value for delay, but by the way, my assumption is noisy. And therefore, whatever offset I'm going to get is going to be noisy also. So then it becomes a problem. Can I, uh, I mean, if I can't calibrate, can I? Uh, statically, can I do runtime, right? So, can I develop a strategy so that at runtime I can deal with this, uh, deal with this challenge? And kind of answer is, yeah. I mean, uh, this uh, sure. So that leads to this uh, thing, which you can loosely say that I'm jointly trying to estimate uh, the delay and the offset. So now, what happens is we arrange for a bidirectional message exchange. Okay, or or you can imagine some other thing. Maybe I have three nodes. A sends a message to B, B sends to C, C sends to A. Then I have a triangular estimate. Uh, but this is the simplest case, right? A sends to B, B sends to A. Uh, and we play the same game of uh, time stamping. So uh, A time stamps, B time stamps, and then uh, B sends the packet back, and uh, it's also time stamped. And usually in this packet that B is sending, it will carry the information about uh, C to A, uh, sorry, C to B, also along with it. Point is, at the end of this exchange, node A has all the four timestamps, and then it can uh, compute, uh, it can solve these two equations. Um, but uh, the problem is that you have three variables and two equations, so an assumption gets made, which is that delays are reciprocal. Now that is true for uh, wireless links. It's electric, um, uh, but is like a point-to-point -point wireless thing. They are not true um, if you are using fundamentally different technologies in the two directions. And in the wired uh, case, if you are over a network and all, that may not be true at all because your packets may be taking different routes, for example. But if delay reciprocity holds true, uh, then you can solve this equation and uh, simple uh, pair of linear equations, and you'll have the two values. 
Because remember, offset, like if B is ahead of A, then the same equation going back, I've got negative in it, right? I mean, if B is ahead of A, so I'm assuming in this case, off, offset is from A to B, right? So, and that, that by kind of definition is the net break, right? So, so uh, you could write here plus offset B to A, and then say we know that offset B to A is the same as offset B to A. So, uh, are, there, are there any sort of materials that work as sort of one-way mirrors for RF signals, uh, like, that, that makes the wireless delay one for this direction, but it's different for this direction? I'm pretty sure there are. So there's like a, some sort of wall Well, I mean, you can always imagine an adversary can create such a material by uh, by changing uh, things over time. Okay, so uh, in the sense that uh, if I know when the message exchange is happening, I can cause the channel to change in the middle. Okay, and so that way you can certainly are there passive such things? I don't know. Someone, anyone from EM background? Can, okay. But I know there are some pretty funky materials, meta materials, as they call, all around, which have some pretty interesting properties. So, quite possibly, it may exist. And I think that might be an interesting way for an adversary to yeah, do something. Yeah. yeah. So, actually, so the interesting thing out here is also that. The content of these packets, remember these packets are carrying timestamps and obviously some other header stuff. You can encrypt them and all, so you can protect it. But can, if an adversary can change the delay, as uh, Leon was suggesting, then I can attack the time simulators. And his concept of something which so, uh, has different delays in a different direction can, uh, uh, can work there. But there are other ways also, like for example, what I can do is, um, if I knew when you are going to send this packet, if I can predict it, then right at that moment, I will jam this receiver. I'm going to transmit the radio signal, I will jam B. So B is not going to see anything, uh, And meanwhile, what I'll do is, I'll capture this packet, and then after a little bit of a delay, we transmit it. I don't do anything, I don't, I don't attempt to, uh, uh, break the crypto or anything like that. I literally just take the encrypted packet and just after a little bit of delay, transmit it. And now I still didn't be changed. Now the circuit is in delay. And this, these kind of attacks are possible. Uh, people have demonstrated it and people are exploiting it. Okay. Uh, so uh, so uh, that's a tricky one to this man in the middle delay attack as we are called. These are pretty hard to uh, hard to hard to do. Now, uh, you can do this manipulation with radio waves pretty much only in one direction. That is, you can increase the delay, uh, right? Uh, shrinking the delay is hard, uh, very hard with radios because speed of light is a max. Uh, but you can shrink the delay in case of acoustic signals, right? Because uh, if uh, if I have two underwater nodes which they're talking acoustically, if I really am hell bent on breaking them, and this is the kind of things that uh, whatever nation state type players can certainly do, uh, I capture the acoustic signal, I send it up, radio link, long radio link, come down. Okay, so I basically beat the acoustic signal, and then now I can shrink it also. So you can do distance enhancement obviously very easily. But you can also do distance shrinkage in some some cases. Uh, what are the relative differences of, like, for example, uh, the the wire delay versus a radio delay? So for the wire, is it faster than the radio signal? And At short distances, surely it is. I mean, if you think about it uh, from this plot, you see that these numbers are in uh, microseconds out here, right? I mean, it's obviously not propagation. Right. If you are doing it in the lab, it would have been nanoseconds. So that means that the radio delay, that circuitry on either side, is in microseconds. That's propagating it. Okay. So, so this bidirectional exchange basically gives us delta t, right? I mean, it's it's giving us the offset. So you can think of this bidirectional message exchange as a sensor. It is sensing delta t, whereas you can think of uh, 
this exchange as uh, something which is giving you the drift, right? Or, or like multiple of these are giving you giving you a drift. So, in general, now you can combine these things into a strategy like the following. I can periodically uh, or whatever less frequently, I can do a delta t measurement. So, like we estimate delta t at that point, it's kind of like uh, resetting us. And in between, I can do the drift estimate. And then using the delta t plus the drift estimate, I can estimate delta t at any other point in time, right? So, so I, uh, by measuring uh, these, these things together. And you can go fence here. I mean, this, is, this was a view simply of two nodes. But you could imagine that, uh, remember I said triangular things can also be used. So like if A sends to B, B sends to C, C sends to A, then uh, again, I have kind of a closed loop system, and I can solve solve that equation. Also, I got one more offset there, uh, uh, and but I also got one more equation. Uh, and assuming uh, I mean, uh, that clock offsets are transitive, which is uh, uh, true. So, uh, so at a network scale, you can kind of go with a method where you, instead of everyone doing this bidirectional pairwise exchange, you can exploit a uh, uh, lot of other exchanges, right? I mean, it's like A talks to B, B talks to C, C talks to D. Uh, A never talks to D directly, but it can still end up synchronizing. So if my clock is uh, a little bit ahead of yours, and your clock is a little bit ahead of the person behind, or be, uh, I can kind of add them up. I can do an algebra uh, over the clock offset to kind of do uh, things. So I could do more complicated things, but right now, just this bidirectional stuff. So uh, sources of synchronization error in this game, I mean, anything which gives you uncertainty is basically your, uh, not your friend. Uh, so uh, yeah, time stamping errors uh, is one. Um, particularly if you time stamp up at the software level, it's going to be highly uncertain. And in systems like NTP, which are really of doing the time stamping in a user process, um, a big culprit is just that. Um, um, but the problem is that our software systems are not designed in a manner where we can say, I'm sending this packet out. And by the way, on the way out, can you timestamp this packet? Uh, these kind of software interfaces just aren't, just aren't provided, I guess, because uh, these systems are targeting uh, applications where this timing needs were not as uh, valuable. Um, so there's timestamp accuracy. Uh, then uh, um, uh, there is kind of each one of these layers also introduce uh, additional variation. So propagation delay can change because uh, well, what what all can change propagation delay? Yeah. So, what about the medium? Like, what all, what can, what all things can, huh? Uh, yeah, first order, but uh, I mean, uh, there will be very minor effect. First thing, things move, right? Uh, so, move, movement can change the distance. That's one. Movement can also cause the signal to take a longer path. Like, for example, let's say I'm talking to him, and then some obstacle come in the middle. Uh, so, before that. The direct path was a stronger one, so bouncing from the walls was being ignored. But when that obstacle comes in the middle, then what you'll hear is something which is bouncing off, and now that's a longer path. So uh, things have changed. Uh, there, so there's variation that may happen. So any environment where things are moving, you are going to see uh, uncertainty arise because of that. Um, uh, then uh, circuit, what? Huh? Multi yeah, so basically multipath is what I'm describing, right? So environment can change. Uh, what do you think can cause delay in the change in the delay of Tx and Rx? Yeah, so what, what about? Huh? Temperature, right? Environmental conditions affect the circuit delays. So if they change, then that delay changes, right? So any variation is kind of a source of, source of error. Um, uh, another thing which happens is um, some of the radios just don't let you timestamp at a low level. So like your typical Wi-Fi radios and all, you don't even have any con control over timestamping. Fundamentally, what timestamping requires is the following. 
that the radio has to tell you, give you some sort of a signal corresponding to a precise point in the packet. Let's say when the preamble was finished, right? I mean, if, if, if the radio can give me a mark signal of some form saying, now that point happened, okay? Then you can go ahead and timestamp it, right? So every time the radio receives a packet, if it can tell me now the preamble was totally received, then I can go ahead and use any clock to timestamp it. Uh, or uh, assuming the radio wasn't doing, uh, is not doing it itself. So what re what is required for good timestamping is a little bit of information from the radio, okay? Uh, or likewise on the transmit side, uh, assuming I'm happy to send a timestamp later, uh, then what the radio has to provide is the ability to uh, send out a signal when the packet was being sent out and it could again be some particular point, like the first byte of the payload every time that would happen. So some of these radios, like uh, CC2420, they added these kind of signals, okay? So, uh, so um, if you're working with them, uh, and this is at the level now you're designing your own, uh, whatever, at the level of your own board or uh, you have some, some degree of visibility into the board, you get these kind of signals. Um, but mm, otherwise, generic radios, the only service they provide is give me a packet, I'll send it, and um, timing is really highly, uh, totally hidden, hidden on the radio. Now, another complication, um, uh, yeah. actually this is just going into detail. Uh, so another complication which comes in this picture, so ignore the slide, this is just explaining what I already did, uh, is that if, uh, if I'm trying to synchronize with something which is multiple hops away, okay? Um, so remember in the NTP server, I had that view that yeah, there are some well-known servers and I'm going there. So there are two ways of dealing with it, this issue. One way of dealing with it is, let's say I'm A goes to the server, uh, B through C in the middle. So one approach is A says, uh, I think of everyone as a server of sorts. So A synchronizes with C and C synchronizes with B. And uh, then I add up the time offsets. But then intermediate nodes also become kind of complicated. Okay, they have to do, they have to take part in my synchronization protocol. Um, alternatively, I could say, you know, I will just think as if I have a single hop, even though C is in the middle. But then I'm at the mercy of what C is doing because it's adding some delay. It is going to, it's receiving a packet and forwarding it. So there's gonna be some forwarding delay and that's going to add some uncertainty, quite a bit actually. If you look at routers and all, they add milliseconds of uh, latency or tens of milliseconds of latency. So what has, uh, the solution to this is for routers to cooperate a little bit. So if my messages are carrying timestamps, and we know that the time, purpose of the timestamp is uh, uh, for these kind of protocols, then, uh, then you could imagine I could design my intermediate nodes so that they adjust the timestamp, okay? So let's imagine uh, uh, I'm sending a packet, A is sending a packet to B, and A timestamped it as T1, but C is in the middle and C receives it. Now, if C wasn't there, the T1 was accurate. But since C is there, so C receives the packet, and after some delta delay forwards it, so there is now an error introduced of delta. So what these uh, time savvy routers do is, when they're sending the packet out to B, when they're forwarding, then they adjust T1, which was embedded in the packet, with the delta. Okay, so you basically constantly adjust so that the delays that happen at the routers, and that includes queuing delay and all, are basically compensated for. So uh, with some assist from the network infrastructure, even over multiple hops, you can do uh, pretty pretty good. The problem is that most of these routers and all are not like that, okay? So you can do these kind of games only in kind of uh, dedicatedly designed uh, systems where, um, where um, I think like, um, if you are CERN or military or financial institutions and all where you could kind of afford to do these kind of dedicated things. So uh, 
time stamping mechanism. So um, yeah, I think I kind of already walked you through this, but basic basic thing is to achieve precise time stamping. Uh, the underlying sort of radio hardware has to provide to now the digital part some sort of a signal which lets me precisely mark a point in the packet. So in CI CP2420, for example, there is a particular signal on a pin called SFB pin, which the radio generates every time it is receiving a packet. So it has received a success preamble successfully, and it has also uh, receive what is called a start of frame delimiter. Okay, so it has received some addition time. And at this point, uh, between SFT field and the length field, at this point, it basically generates a signal. Okay, and uh, so you see that on the SFT pin. And now, at the next level up uh, in your processor, you put a range to be interrupted by it. So what's happening now is radio is giving you a packet. And radio is also sending an interrupt. And essentially, the semantics are the radio is saying, this packet I received. And by the way, its SFD byte or SFD feed ended at precisely the point my signal went up. Now, it sounds great, but there's still uncertainties even in this process. There are two sources of uncertainty. Firstly, radio internally is operating on a clock, right? And these are usually 10, 20 megahertz type clocks. And remember, it's probably some sort of a state machine which is generating that uh, SFD signal. So this SFD signal is never going to be precisely when SFD arrived. It is going to be at the next clock tick after this, and plus whatever other delay that the state machine may have. So there is still some residual error that remains out there. And it may sound like I'm nitpicking, but if you're aiming for nanosecond type things, then each one of those things kind of add up. So, uh, but but it certainly does much better than uh, would otherwise. This is showing a Wi-Fi uh, radio, and here things are a lot harder because usually Wi-Fi stuff was not designed for this purpose. So, well, firstly, a lot of times these were like uh, early days of Wi-Fi. These were just cards that you would plug in, and then later on when uh, they became embedded into motherboards, they were kind of still operating using similar interfaces. So you basically have no visibility into, 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 into that. Moreover, anything which is working over USB is not going to give you these kind of signals. So this does require cooperating hardware. On the Ethernet side, there are Ethernet cards which do that time stamping down in the hardware. And then what they do is, instead of giving you the SFD pin, they basically append the timestamp into the data that they are providing. So it's almost like uh, the packet is coming in and the hardware is taking care of the timestamping. It can insert a timestamp into a packet or it can append it, so you can kind of make, 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 make use of that. Okay, so, um, yeah, already gone. Okay, uh, the other thing is that, um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, Mm -hmm. Right. So those, this, those are. Uh, so what they provide is not the PTP protocol. What they provide is a timestamping support. Okay. So it's not like the Ethernet cards are doing the synchronization for you, but they're providing that critical piece. And uh, modern Ethernet chips are, do have that capability uh, generally at this stage. Um, uh, so in principle, you. Should should be able to use them. It's just a matter of exploiting that capability. Uh, yeah. And also in the there is a CI board. Mm -hmm. uh, SFD is basic, very old right? Yeah, and then you you tie it to the interrupt pin of your processor, and then you do that uh, shadow register from the counter, and now you have your timestamp. Uh, but what is that interrupt? Does it have to have a CI? Then you have problems. So those are all sources of error. Now the thing is, if you are working with microcontroller. What you'll probably do is you will, instead of using the interrupt, you are probably going to use the, uh, what I was just saying, that you are going to use the counter cap, uh, the timer capture, right? So you will have a pin, you will tell configure the timer to say, at that pin, capture the timer into this register, 
okay and now you still have to coordinate right because what's happen happening is you're getting packets and then you're getting these events right you still have to correlate the two right the idea is whatever packet I'm currently receiving is also the one which is giving me uh, resulted in the timer so you still have to do work at the software but at least you have the information to go. So I would like Sure. Uh, so, what I would suggest is seeing if ESP32 uh, provides some sort of a, assuming you are working with Wi Fi there or Bluetooth or yeah. with BLE, yeah. Uh, it's going to be trickier there, okay. I doubt that it will have such a, such a signal because BLE. Um, radios um, usually do not uh, usually they connect to the main processor over a serial port serial link and therefore you do not have such information that I'm talking about flowing through that's okay so uh, that that is not to say that you can't still do it because one of the things also that works in your favor is most BLE radios have a processor inside the radio also which actually handles a protocol. And usually, you can modify the firmware there. So it's possible to do it, but it's a lot more complex. Yeah. So that's the biggest pack tank in BLE. Would it come down to accessing like larger uh, yeah, that's, and then doing like a I mean, that's more, certainly the- More tricky software type of uh, estimation game? Like you, 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 could, uh, you, you, you could, you um, could. Basically, again, there is an increase in absolute delay because it goes, goes over the serial link, but there is also variation, and unfortunately, that variation you just have to live with, okay? But what you hope is that uh, by doing some smart regression on that, you would be able to compensate for it. So the other thing is you can train a neural network model or SVM or some other thing on top of it and work with it. Some of the very recent work, uh, remember that slide I showed, straight line fitting, right? Um, there's a work out of Stanford Google last year which basically uses an SVM too, and they showed very, really, really strong results. Over the wide internet, they're able to get to like deep into some micro, uh, some microsecond, okay? And uh, it's a system called Hy Huygens, H-U-Y, Huygens, who I guess did. Huygens, yeah. what was the output of the SVM? Uh, the estimate of the basically uh, is predicting the uh, drift. Okay. Yeah. So. So, uh, like, in terms of saying that, if you are working in like a, a highly populated frequency, like the, the cellular frequency, the signal in the data, the wave in the data, then you can like never get away from zero, like uh, estimation. Okay. So, so remember again, mean delay you can compensate, right? I mean, so your culprit is the spread. But even the spread may be predictable, right? Right, exactly. So you do a data-driven manner. That's right. uh, so. That's what the Stanford paper showed. You guys, from, since you're doing a project in this space, yeah, yeah. But it's basically it's about being uh, variation. Variation is not good. But if I can predict what the uh, delay would be, I'm good to go. Right. So, um, so that's. That's the name of the game out here, right? right? I mean, so uh, whether you do through a data-driven model or these kind of simple linear models and all, kind of, they're all driving towards the same thing. Okay, so, any question? Okay, so basic strategy then is that if the radio or lower level hardware in general gives me a point in the packet, then I can timestamp that, or like in the case of newer Ethernet hardware, they actually give you the timestamp, okay, and you have access to that. But somehow or the other, you could. Those Ethernet cards actually, the ones, okay, they actually internally have a very precise clock also, and they also expose that clock frequency also. And usually that crystal is going to be very stable, so you might also want to uh, lock your processor's clock to that somehow. So you can run a synchronization, local synchronization protocol between the Ethernet and the main processor so that you essentially derive, uh, your, your time base gets locked to it, okay? So you could almost say now, what's happening is my CPU locks to my Ethernet card, this Ethernet card 
synchronizes in effect kind of with the Ethernet card on the other end and then that Ethernet card is synchronized with the CPU at the other end. So it, what seems like a single hop system is really deep down three hops. Because the I, um, I don't know. You'll have to look because if the, if the, uh, the, the problem is the following, that uh, the Ethernet cards which are uh, USB based, while they can embed the timing info, uh, timing information as part of the frame they are sending to you, they have no way of sending the clock to you. So all you will get in that case is a timestamp, but you will not have access to that stable frequency because USB is not designed to transmit that to you. So you're kind of constrained by whatever interface you're using to talk to the underlying hardware and what that slide with the CC2420 was doing, we were basically saying that, look, there is some additional information that comes in. Okay. Uh, if you have well-behaved distributions, then it's great. So rem again, if you go back to that plot I showed, straight line and noisy measurements around it, if the measurement noise around it was Gaussian or something nice, then you are going to get, get an averaging effect. On the other hand, if you have like outliers and stuff like that, uh, the results may not be, uh, may not be that uh, great. Okay, so the approach thus far therefore was uh, two nodes want to synchronize, A sends to B, B sends back to A, and we have four timestamps, we solve it. Uh, now, for that to work well, I needed to be able to timestamp at a pretty low level, because if I timestamp at the software level, then the uncertainty, particularly in the Mac layer, the, where you do the arbitration to grab the channel, is a lot. Um, uh, if uh, remember th these things that are showing, this is really at the low level thing, right? But if I were to put the Mac layer and were to say I'm timestamping it, uh, going back to a slide, if I were to say I'm timestamping it out here, okay, then the delay variance in this Mac layer is going to kick in, and that's a lot because if my network is crowded, then I will wait more out here. If the network is lightly loaded, less so. And the way underlying protocols like um, uh, CSMA, which is what is used in Ethernet, and similar things which are used on wireless, uh, there's a lot of jitter in that. Okay, so it's pretty lousy. So, uh, but uh, but yet we have radios where I do not have low-level timestamping, and yet I want to get good performance. Receiver side is somewhat better because there is no queuing delay. So uh, if I were to do time stamping on software, I am kind of, um, will face more uncertainty uh, versus if I were to do it lower, but not nowhere near as much as if Mac layer delay is coming into play. So the question is, could I do better? Um, and the answer is for those kind of systems, okay, where I don't have that low level control and yet I want to achieve good performance, okay? Uh, so, uh, let's do the following. Um, we are at 5.03 p.m., so let's do a five minute break, uh, and then I'm gonna describe that method, okay? It's something which actually, uh, while kind of the idea was, had been pursued in a paper before, but the big push from it came from one of the faculty in CS some years ago. So, I'm gonna talk about that, but let's do a five minute break. and see what, what, what might we be able to use for our project? Sure. Uh, I have to take the faculty candidate out for dinner. Okay. Maybe one thing no you can worries. do is, uh, I have three of um, Akash and Nat and Leon. Any of you are going to be around in the lab after the class? I will be You will be? Okay. So just drop them in. Okay, okay, cool. Okay. And then we can pretty much just use whatever or don't know what we can uh, Well, uh, I mean, with Leon's permission, yeah. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. 
So you would think like a trainer or something? Yeah, like yeah, we just see around and see some like bars and stuff for projects. But we will see okay. we plan on doing some kind of like rebuttal project. So we wanted to get a good title for the bar show. Yeah, I mean you can take any components and all. That's fine. No instruments, or at least no big instruments. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, okay. yeah. 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 Ye
you look at that spread to get the estimate of what the queuing delay was, and then you subtract that out. So actually, the paper that I was talking about from Stanford kind of exploits this technique. So I'm kind of hand waving my way around it, but there are some some things you could you could do in that direction. But short answer to your question: if you have the right equipment, you can. Okay. Uh, other thing I wanted to cover was that there was a question that uh, what is this MAC that I was talking about? Okay. So MAC refers to medium access control, and devices have MAC address. So that's the address which is used by the protocols, which uh, the MAC protocols. But what hap MAC protocols uh, are the protocol? You, they are the arbitration protocols. Whenever you have a shared medium, whether it's Ethernet or wireless, you need some sort of uh, protocol so that two receivers which are trying to transmit at the same time are going to be able to transmit in a coherent manner as in not trash each other because it's kind of futile if two people try to transmit at the same time because their packets are going to uh, collide with each other. So we have seen one example of MAC protocol earlier in the course uh, and that was when we talked about the CAN bus. And if you recall, in the CAN bus, there was this priority, and we were playing out the priorities, and we were doing this bit, uh, bit by bit ending. And then at the end, we were left with a single winner, and then that winner got to transmit. Now, that's not a very efficient way of doing things when you are operating at network speed. So there are other types of strategies, and none of them will, uh, well, most of them, will not eliminate simultaneous transmission, but they will reduce the probability quite significantly. So one is simply, and that does eliminate, is we sub simply have a schedule. So uh, we basically say, I'm got, uh, I'm, I can, A can send to B in time slot number one, B can send to C in time slot number two, and so on and so forth. We develop a schedule, advertise it, and everyone follows that. By definition, in this case, we are arranging no collision. More commonly, uh, what is done is you sniff the channel. So you say, is anyone transmit? You kind of listen. Is there, is there any, any transmission going on on the network? If not, I will transmit. The problem with that is two people may be doing that test exactly at the same time. So then you need some additional features around it. And uh, the standards like A2.11 and all, they define what that protocol is. In fact, a big part of that standard is the finite state machine that each node has to run as part of this protocol. So they're pretty complicated and they also do power management and all. You can almost think of MAC protocols as playing the same role that the schedulers do in operating systems, which we spent a lot of time on, uh, except uh, their job is harder in a way because they're distributed across nodes, right? They're really deciding who gets to use the channel. So which transmission to schedule on the channel, except my tasks are distributed across uh, network, as opposed to, and I'm trying to share, uh, I'm scheduling the wireless link or the Ethernet uh, link, okay? Uh, but, but that's kind of the basic concept. So the MAC stands for that. And the reason this delay happens is, in case uh, when I try to transmit, there, uh, uh, the channel was busy. And the extent to which the channel would be busy will depend upon how much other traffic there is. So if there's a lot of traffic, the chances that I would spend a lot of time in the queue are higher. Okay? Same kind of thing, like you could say, again, in scheduling terms, I may have a deadline. This packet has to go out by this time, and I can miss it. Uh, so there's a lot of commonality between what we discussed earlier in the course and what MAC protocols do. One more complication, which is radios are mostly that you encounter are half duplex. Half duplex means that they can either send or receive, but not both simultaneously. And therefore, there's an additional constraint that um, uh, that my radio could be in just one of these two modes, okay, and therefore that can add to additional delays. There are some, there are radios, uh, firstly, you can always have full duplex radio by having two radios listening on two different frequencies. Um, uh, there are some cool work which has happened in recent times on creating so-called fully duplex radios, which work on the same frequency. So the challenge in the same frequency is the following. I'm sending something, and I'm also trying to receive something on the same frequency. So my own signal is also going to be heard by me, right? So it's, uh, so it's kind of like 
if you are speaking to me and at the same time I'm speaking, then your signal, which is traveling to my ears after decaying, is swamped out by my own uh, voice, except we, we are smarter than that, right? We can still hear it. And the reason is my brain knows what I'm speaking, and therefore it cancels out my voice, and we still pick up uh, what you're speaking. Uh, something similar can be done for the radios. I know what I'm sending, and therefore I know that the signal coming into my receive antenna is what I'm saying and what the other party is saying, except it's saying it, uh, it's a power is a lot lower, but I can subtract out my signal and still listen to it. So with appropriate processing, you can pull these things off. So there are full duplex radios which simplify the Mac pro problem somewhat, but uh, fundamentally the sharing, uh, uh, scheduling a shared resource is always going to be there in bodies. Okay, so, uh, so the ch uh, issue I was describing was that um, uh, we are faced with these situations where our time stamping can only happen uh, at a place where there is remains a lot of jitter on the transmitter side. Okay, and let's say assume that the receive side is okay. Receive side can receive can uh, once the packet comes in, it reaches with reasonably low delay all the way up the software stack. Uh, so the strategy out here is the following. It's kind of like, um, let's say the, some event happens, like a loud sound happens. And I can jot, make a timestamp of it on my watch, and you can make a timestamp of it on your watch. And as long as we know there was a common signal, then we can compare our timestamps and we can know what our offset was, right? Um, it's the analogy of that thing that works out here. So this, in this case, instead of a sender and a receiver synchronizing, the, we change it to two receivers synchronizing. And this is great for settings, again, where MAC delays are going to be there. And uh, so, so or, 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 or for whatever reason, time stamping at the sender is not very accurate. So what happens out here is that the sender sends out a packet. It doesn't timestamp it, but it carries some sort of a unique ID, you know, sex sequence ID. And the receivers are receiving it, and since they have a unique ID, it's fine, and they timestamp it. And remember our original sender timestamping can be lousy. In fact, we're not even timestamping it anymore, but the uh, receiver timestamping is reasonably good, as it generally is. And then, yeah, this is it. And then what I can do is I can compare the two, so there's some subsequent message exchange between receivers, and they can run the offset. And you can do this thing for a group of receivers, like this channel is broadcasting, whole bunch of people hear it, and then they can do some communication among them to figure out what the offset was. So there was a very early system in 90s, uh, or uh, called CGMJ, uh, but it was in a, Obscure conference, none of, uh, one of those EE conferences that people kind of dismiss and all. The idea came out there, and then it got picked up in computer science, particularly um, both here at UCLA, and uh, this is in a chip which you hear, uh, which way, so it's called radio broadcast synchronization was a system, and it kind of got a lot of uh, lot of attention because uh, it suddenly solved the problem for the case where I don't have low level control over the radio. Um, so over Wi-Fi things and all, you could do it. So, Kash. Yeah. So, uh, we talked about that the time sampling at sender is not. Is no longer needed. All the sender needs to do is send a packet. It's like a common event. And it doesn't even need to be a radio packet. I could have, uh, I could do this thing with any sensing modality, right? I mean, I could do it with a flash, uh, flash a light and all my nodes have some sort of uh, optical detector or a camera, or I could make a big sound, and all of these things will do it, right? Anything which we can uniquely agree that that event that you heard and the event I heard was the same event, I'm good to go, uh, right? So uh, 4G LTE has target positioning, so mm -hmm. can you say a picture of uh, having a distinction between cellular calls and your data against the sampling of the data? So and like let's say that on my phone I have like multiple uh, modalities like so multiple apps that do the same thing like ATP call. One is like mm -hmm. my interest app, then I have a WhatsApp call, I have Instagram call, I have Facebook Messenger call, and all of them are like, coming the same time from the response like both of them are coming on the same time. So so like then wouldn't there be a few like 
giving me the noun with zero points? Well, again, okay, remember the first thing out here is we're talking about single hop system, right? Okay, so imagine all your phones out here. Let's imagine for the sake of argument that um, your phones are running an app which are all listening on a microphone. And I clap, okay? All those apps have heard that sound and uh, they, and let's imagine that this clapping I do relatively infrequently. So every time your app appears to clap, it knows uh, that maybe others have and then you exchange information about the clap time and uh, the next clap will happen subsequently later. So you run some rapid information exchange and now you can synchronize yourself. And I can do another clap a little bit later, another clap a little bit later, and now you can do regression over those offsets that you are getting. Right? That's the system out here. Uh, whether your phone is running other things and all can affect time stamping accuracy out here. Okay? So indeed, one of the challenge is that if you're not time stamping at a low level, then uh, the time stamping here is not going to be accurate. So I guess what you're trying to say in your example is what if I have multiple apps running and uh, uh, they will compete, and absolutely. And that is one of the reasons why time stamping at the software level is a, not a great idea because you are also dealing with queuing delay, right? So this packet comes from the receiver, but it sits at the OS because your poor process is no priority. So what is very important is to have a way that uh, the packet receives, uh, it, it, it reaches up. So if you have a, uh, I mean, I, I don't have any answer which will satisfy on a smartphone, unfortunately, other than to say that certain information pathways are very highly optimized even on smartphone for low latency. One of them is the acoustic pathway. So uh, the operating system, particularly on Apple devices, the acoustic pathway is very low latency just because the kind of applications we deal with there, phone calls and all, you do need low latency. So computers historically have optimized the sound system for low latency. Okay. Um, uh, the other thing I would say, we, let's say like we're using a radio packet like this one, that in that case, um, easy solution is to have a lightly loaded system. But um, uh, none of those are sort of truly satisfactory and if you're on uh, devices where a good robust low latency pathway from pin to application doesn't exist, then whatever uncertainty is gonna be there is gonna be there and that is why low level timestamping is good. But like I said, there are all these platforms where you can't do low latency timestamping, then what? Right, so you guys are, you're working on the Bluetooth thing. My suspicion, my hunch is that Bluetooth probably faces the same issue, which is downlink timestamping, as in transmit time, uh, transmit timestamping is horrible, receive timestamping is just merely bad. And you could sort of uh, work, work off that. But anytime you're operating high enough and you don't really have any way of, any visibility to a lower layer, uh, it's a challenge. But what the system did was it, took care of the major culprit. The big uncertainty is on the sender side and it basically said it doesn't matter. Um, uh, so so uh, this kind of describes uh, uh, in terms of uh, the message exchange, but basically what's happening is that the sender at some point decides to send a packet and if I'm sending radio packets, I can embed a unique ID in it so I, I can, uh, that can be compared. Uh, there is going to be a lot of delay in the outgoing transmitter, uh, but all these receivers are going to hear uh, these packets, and depending upon the distance from the transmitter, they, they're going to hear it slightly, just slightly different times, but roughly the same. And now they can compare and say what are the mutual uh, deltas. So the error in this case is going to be any error in time stamping at the receiver, as well as any difference in distance uh, from the trans transmitter to the different receivers. So right, I mean, if one distance is D1 and the other is D2, then D2 minus D1 times, uh, uh, sorry, divided by the speed of light is going to be an error component there as well. So, uh, so situations where your signal is very slow, like acoustic, this error can be quite huge. 
on the other hand um, um, and, and likewise if you are working with um, let, let, let's say this was you're doing it in Wi-Fi and uh, let's say the range of your access point is 100 meters and you have R1 within a meter or two same room as the access point and R2 is in the far corner of the building then the propagation delay difference between the two is going to play into out here so those factors come into play but it's a lot better than this delay which can be in milliseconds or tens of milliseconds occasionally okay so because this is really a scheduler as we talked about earlier and depending upon what the scheduling is doing it can be it can be pretty lousy so uh, so RBS is only sensitive to differences in receive time and propagation delay uh, so that's its advantage relative to a sender receiver type system this kind of system which was time stamping at a high level right if this was time stamping at a low level then uh, this wins out because I'm time stamping at a low level right so I'm not suffering from those massive delays um, so um, uh, upshot all, of all of this is that uh, how your system performs is really dependent upon these uncertainties. That's really kind of uh, what, what, what is happening and anything you can do to help out there, uh, and anything your algorithms can do to sort of reduce that uncertainty or factor it out sort of helps out there. <coughs> so uh, the trick to getting sender receiver to work, uh, well, is to have low level time stamping. And if you cannot low level timestamp, and if your system can permit, then this kind of radio broadcast approach works well. Uh, now having said that, um, the two way handshake has one big advantage. It does a bi-directional exchange. Now purely in terms of message count, this and this are competitive. Remember what happens here is initial broadcast and then information exchange between them. Right, so that they can compute the deltas. What happens in this is initial broadcast. So imagine if I was trying to do it with multiple beams. So I can have initial broadcast with everyone here, and then one by one they send back the packets. Okay, so again I will have n plus one, and you could structure this one also in a n plus one fashion. So in terms of spectrum usage, they are they are the same, but they are relying they're making they're going to work well in sort of different kind of settings. But one advantage sender receiver has is the following. Any uncertainty that does exist, it turns out that gets divided by two. So the error terms differ. So uh, let's see. Yeah, I don't have the equations for it. But the main thing is the following. If you solve these equations, you see this divided by two. And therefore, any time stamping error has a divide by two component. Whereas in this key, we are just comparing the timestamps, and therefore any error in those timestamps show up as they are. So the sensitivity to error in timestamp is factor of two higher here. So if you are able to do low-level timestamping, then you would expect to see factor of two better performance with the sender receiver uh, uh, than uh, than RBS. Okay, now. The flip side is that again, RBS can work in settings where um, uh, sender side uh, uncertainty could be huge, okay, and you can still work with it. So, uh, so the so the sender sender uh, approach uh, kind of works pretty well. I think. Let me see. Okay, yeah. Um, so probably the most, uh, one of the more um, robust and highly cited uh, time sync protocol uh, in the space of IoT devices and all was something called uh, FTSP, which was out of Vanderbilt University. Uh, so it's called flooding time synchronization protocol. And it kind of brought together a whole bunch of these ideas that I have talked about in a particular configuration. So first thing it does is uh, that it uh, does 
low level time stamping and it does a lot of pre characterization of the radio delays and then what it does is it el elects a leader in the network and that leader sends out a broadcast and that broadcast traverses to the first hop neighbors and traverses to the next hop neighbor and a little bit like what leon was suggesting it keeps since it's all of it is software so the forwarding is happening in the software control so it also compensates for the delays so what happens is that everyone is getting uh, a packet which has been compensated for the delay and uh, now we have a one directional message exchange and then it applies the sender receiver type of the idea that we were talking about so essentially one flow of packets through the network with compensation for the delays let you apply an rbs type scheme with careful compensation uh, pre calibration to compensate for all the delays so it's bringing all those ideas and additionally it does that whole linear regression business and with something like this um, uh, they are able to get uh, pretty th th this this is uh, so ftsp was around 2005 or 6 so it's almost 14 15 years old but so the radios of that era but they were able to get like microsecond type delays which were pretty impressive at the time to the extent that at that time the afghanistan war was going on and also the system was deployed on tiny little devices uh, for gun sniper localization systems and all. So this was a DARPA project and these guys kind of deployed so like <laughs> sniper fires and these little devices will try to localize where the fire happened so that you know the location of the sniper and kind of react to that. So, so uh, it was, uh, and what they, the way they uh, ran the system was that they just did this process of broadcasting periodically, 30 seconds. Uh, a message every 30 seconds and uh, kind of lots of other sort of uh, things going on in the system but basically uh, uh, they were bringing together all these sort of ideas that uh, that, that I mentioned a lot of low level time stamping and all to the extent that uh, the stability of the CPU clock became kind of the culprit for them so I'm going to skip through these uh, but just wanted to bring out that since uh, FTSP uses this broadcast mechanism, so it has a factor of two disadvantage that you see, and you kind of see it play out out here um, yeah, yeah, between RBS and uh, sender receiver scheme. So sender receiver uh, gets a mean error of 0.8, and over the same radio that you do RBS, you get around three microseconds. Okay, so that gap is because uncertainty plays. Uh, is uh, directly into this. So in this case, both sides are doing low level time stamping, and yet you see that whatever uncertainty does exist uh, result in a less accurate system. FTSP, because it also does low level time stamping and additionally brings to bear a lot of calibration of delays and all, um, brings together a lot of advantages and kind of does, does, does pretty good network wide sync there. So this is 15 years ago, uh, roughly, okay. So at that time, uh, a microsecond per hop uh, was done. Today, you can, uh, with this, with kind of the newer generation of radios, which are giving out that SFD signal and stuff like that, you can get into 10 nanosecond, 15 nanosecond, and with some good design to uh, sort of, uh, single digit nanosecond thing so those are that's where kind of I would say state of the art is using essentially fairly vanilla hardware uh, there okay I already talked about this um, so um, I earlier on our tech I, I talked about this linear fitting of the uh, model to get the clock drift but the challenge, one of the challenges out here is that to do these kind of schemes, you are making multiple measurements, right? I mean, every so often you do a message exchange. And you can apply this kind of scheme to sender receiver or receiver receiver, both of them the same way. But the issue is, could I minimize how often I have to synchronize? How often I have to do this message exchange? 
and there it is worthwhile thinking why why do i have to do this decision why and the, and the reason is that this flow is not constant in the sense if i look at different time windows the clocks are drifting weirdly and therefore the relative drift between them is changing and therefore i cannot just apply the linear model forever right so i have to keep kind of changing it so that's why we have to do it frequently enough so that uh, uh, I'll continue to, my, my linear model is valid. And at the same time, the drifts are relatively, uh, uh, seem to be relatively unpredictable, so um, I can't directly go with it. But this is where what helps is perhaps going a little bit into the physics again. So remember the cause for those drift phenomena and all is temperature. Now, I talked about. Uh, and kind of the last slide say that uh, temperature um, could you could have stable clocks, temperature compensated clocks. So you can fit put um, simple clocks. Every, um, sorry, you can put costly TCXOs everywhere, but uh, then you are increasing the cost of the system. The alternative, though, is that maybe you can compensate by making use of software. So. This is back to the story that uh, um, uh, the drift estimate are really how often I'm going to be doing these measurements are going to be impacted by two different effects. One is the quantization error and the other is a temperature effect. So if I don't do it, uh, if I don't do the measurement frequently enough, then because of temperature, the clock drift uh, will happen and my linear estimate will no longer be good. So I have to do it frequently enough. And at the same time, doing it too frequently is futile because then the quantization errors are going to begin to dominate. So I have to find that sweet spot and that's where I should sort of stick with. So this slide I had shown earlier, but, uh, uh, but we want to find that sweet spot. So there, what people have explored is uh, approaches where what you do is over um, you don't ask for any factory calibration so don't use TCXOs but if you have a temperature sensor then you can at runtime begin to learn a mapping between temperature and the drift so the idea would be the following let's say I have access somewhere on the network is a stable source and I'm going to synchronize with it and that synchronization, among other things, gives me a drift estimate, right? And I'm also going to look at my temp temperature sensor, and I'm going to make a table. So I'm going to say, temperature 50 degree, the drift was this. Temperature this, the drift was that. And after I have taken some samples, I can fit one of the parametric models of drift versus temperature. And I already talked about that, how these things are cubic to the first order. So maybe a reasonable strategy is to fit a cubic model. And once you have done this model, then at a later point in time when the temperature has changed, what you do is you refer to that table and then say, okay, what is the drift? And I'm going to use that as a drift estimate. And now what you can do is you can, uh, you have suddenly reduced the need to uh, the, the frequency at which, you, uh, at which you have to resynchronize. You can kind of lower it down a lot. So instead of what FTSP was doing every 30 seconds, Maybe you can push it to a day or a few hours or something like that. And that would basically save you messages uh, which have to run on the background, uh, but they're not serving any purpose sensing-wise and all. So anything you can do to reduce the frequency of message exchange, in effect, is reducing your baseline energy. And we're, if you're talking about systems which are low power, then that helps a lot. Today's um, seminar, faculty candidate seminar, uh, this guy was talking about nano, nanowatts type systems, okay? In these systems, uh, even going from 30 second to once every hour will have a huge difference because there's no other traffic. It's only when some rare event happens that you are otherwise going to exchange messages. So, uh, so these kind of methods can help quite a bit also. The Next thing I want to touch upon is uh, settings where uh, 
instead of using RF, you are using acoustic. And many systems which are used uh, use this thing, mostly underwater uh, applications, because, well, there are no radio waves that can meaningfully, uh, you can only travel using uh, very low frequency uh, RF underwater, so like submarines and all use it, okay, but like the nuclear attack orders and all for that. But they are like in bits per second, okay, so they are super slow. And moreover, they require huge antennas. So you might have seen of like these submarines have like kilometer long antenna trailing behind it because the frequency is super low. So pragmatically, underwater, you have to look elsewhere. For short distances, optical works. For short distances, radio can also work, like your Wi-Fi type stuff can work up to 20 centimeters or so. But if you are seeking to go to kilometers and all, you'll have pretty much, acoustic, basically acoustic is the only solution there. But the problem is acoustic is high latency. So uh, you have these kind of systems where on the ocean bed are sensors and then they talk acoustically either among themselves or to buoys and then the buoys then talk to the external world using RF. Uh, buoys can also talk to each other also using RF. But it's kind of basic concept and uh, uh, the folks down at USC kind of do a lot of work in this space. They have a lot of work in petroleum kind of things and also uh, these kind of systems. The challenge out here is that during that send receive operation, I send you a packet, you send it back to me, or um, if I am doing RBS, uh, then I'm sending a message which is heard by someone close to me and someone far to me. The differences are quite a lot. During the message exchange, significant drifts happen. and. Uh, the delay difference between two receivers and the RBS scheme is quite high. So what these systems require is that you have to also take into account the drift that happens during synchronization, during each one of those probes that we are doing. Previously, we could ignore it. Previously, we could basically imagine, remember uh, I had those two equations, and in each one of them, there was a delta offset term, but that delta offset term was the same, right? So that was implicitly saying that the clock offset did not change during those two messages, they were close enough. But in these systems, that's no longer the case. Um, so uh, you have to, essentially in the equations, you have to kind of account for the drift right there also. And that just makes the mo underlying model a lot more complicated. But the main point is you need to do it. So what this is showing is um, uh, sort of uh, if you, don't take into account the drift versus if you do take into account the drift even in that single exchange. So this was, this is a vanilla system and the red one is the one which takes into account the drift compensation and you can kind of see the difference that uh, the error work is much more linear than no, whereas this one is much more rapid. And if you put RBS into this picture, it's pretty horrible because uh, if you're trying to synchronize like near a field of nodes, some are near, some are far, the gap is way too big, and that that is no longer the area of strength for RBS, okay, so that, that kills the system. So, drift is your enemy, you have to kind of take into account that, okay. Uh, let's see, next thing, do I want to start on it? Yeah, okay, so uh, I guess the other thing which has happened in recent times, as in over the last few years, is the adoption and of this precision time protocol or the so-called IEEE 1588 standards. So we heard a little bit of, sort of uh, about it earlier when we were talking about Ethernet and all. So it's a standard which is what, around 10 years old also and there's actually a newer version which kind of came out. Um, uh, the main thing out here was that they were aiming for precision timing in context of applications like factory automation and things like that. Um, it is currently heavily used in, besides factories, financial industry, physics, those kind of uh, places. And there is a whole bunch of companies and all which have emerged. And uh, you can, with careful design, you can push this thing quite aggressively. So people at CERN, for example, have something called White Rabbit, which is a kind of a, a basically 1588 running with 
very carefully calibrated uh, underlying hardware and they can get down to uh, kind of like picosecond, let's say tens of picosecond type thing over CERN, which is like 20, 30 miles, I think, type radius. So over those kind of distances so that they can timestamp atomic events in, in the collider quite accurately. Okay, so that's uh, one of the big users, but um, financial industry which creates their own networks and all, they're, they're heavy users as well. So what 1588 does is uh, kind of a little bit different type of handshake. And uh, so firstly, precise timestamping is key out here because um, and, and, and you need kind of that support at the lowest level. But the challenge that you also face is that uh, it's very hard to timestamp and include the timestamp in the same packet. So you have to se separate it out. So they kind of revisited the synchronization protocol, uh, the, the, that that came, that is, that is happening. And uh, uh, basically the kind of network they envision is that there are, there are these master nodes in the network. And the idea is that the other nodes are trying to synchronize with it. So the way this protocol works is uh, the initial sync message is sent. And the sender notes his timestamp T1. Or, uh, or rather, the hardware kind of uh, gets a timestamp T1. But it just informs the software about T1. Because it cannot include it in the outgoing packet. These are two high speed systems and all, right? I mean, you know, at 10 gig for you. This guy uh, receives it and timestamps it T2 according to its local clock. Meanwhile, the first node follows up with a packet in which it's carrying T1. And this packet is, its timing is not important. The only thing important is that it's carrying T1. So now the second node has T2, which it measures, and it got T1. And then what the second node does is it sends out a packet in the reverse direction. It notes the time T3, which is the time with it. This so the first node receives the packet, notes the time T4, and then sends a packet carrying T4. So now the node number two has T1, T2, T3, T4 and it can basically apply those equations that we had previously. What has happened out here is that they're basically, uh, first thing you know, uh, they're taking care of the reality that I can't timestamp an outgoing packet, okay? Uh, not, not at high speed. And the other thing you see is that um, there are four packets going here as opposed to two. So there's more load on the network. And the third thing that you see is that in our original system, the, part, uh, the entity who learned about the offset was the one who started the handshake. Whereas here, the entity which learns about the offset is the one who was the recipient of the handshake, right? It was initiated by the left, mode, left node, but the offset is being learned by this node. So what happens in PTP systems is basically uh, the master nodes, kind of the so-called, uh, I mean, they have the reference clock. They basically are on the left. They initiate this process, so everyone kind of does it. Whereas in the uh, original version of the handshake that we were using thus far, that was the case where the client, the one who needs to know the delta uh, offset, is the one who initiates it. So that worked well with NTP, right? I mean, I send a request to NTP and it sends me back and I learn the offset. Uh, whereas here, just like the server initiates it and the client is on the right hand side and it runs it. Okay, so this the protocol has changed. So it's costlier um, in terms of bandwidth usage. It's inverted in the sense that the server is the one who's kind of starting the process, but, uh, and, but it has the advantage that uh, you can have precise time stamping because uh, part of the reason uh, NTP couldn't do time, precise time stamping also is that even if it wanted to, it can't insert the packet as it was. Uh, pa uh, insert, insert the timestamp in the outgoing packet, whereas this thing eliminates that problem by, by basically having a second follow-on packet which is carrying that timestamp. So with things like these, you can uh, uh, get pretty good uh, 
time stamping things very easily um, on local area type networks and all you can get like 0.1 microsecond type stuff uh, accuracy is getting into uh, single digit nanoseconds and all require faster sampling uh, better oscillators um, uh, the intermediate switches doing that delay compensation that we were talking about earlier uh, you could go even further uh, but then even things like how asymmetric your cable is when you buy an ethernet cable inside that there are a bunch of wires but if you buy a meter of cable and you measure the length of each one of those wires from connector to connector it's slightly different and now if you begin to talk about over hundreds of hundred meter distances and all that tiny differences uh, translate into error so uh, that white rabbit system from CERN that I was mentioning what they do is they use precisely calibrated cables precise everything is a like super calibrated and all and there are companies which sell you this this kind of equipment I mean okay and uh, all of it is open source hardware so you can design your own system but basically you can really push things down very aggressively if you so wish to do uh, if you uh, want to get into uh, that regime it's um, that's, that's what you uh, picoseconds then you've got to pay for it some of the people on the optical side, uh, including Professor Jalali and uh, Professor Bhavakani's group and all these guys are, uh, uh, these guys talk about femtoseconds, okay? So the optical world is even more aggressive, okay? So uh, a lot of cool stuff happening, of, uh, obviously, but uh, uh, this is what the industrial state of the art is, so to say, yeah. Okay, you had a question. How, how much do you think a meter of that uh, cable would cost uh, I don't know, but CERN's budget is pretty amazing, okay? And uh, um, uh, we had a paper at a conference on precise clocks and timing, which last year, late last year, which took place at CERN. So my student who had gone there was describing, I mean, this is Fatima, went there, okay? So uh, yeah, the talks there were all about people from physics and high performance thing and talking about the critical role time plays in their work, okay, and that kind of precise time. That's okay. So, let me stop out here. And uh, so, remember tomorrow at 4 p.m. So, I had one request to go first. Uh, I'm going to send out a Dropbox link uh, late tonight. Right now, I have to uh, go out, but um, uh, so just upload there um, an hour or two prior is fine, and we'll just. Uh, present in that order. PDF, please. That will make my life a lot easier. PDF? Yeah.